So through the power of restraint, as we begin to let go, to some extent, of the wanting, of the desire, of the anger, it creates the space for a different kind of relationship. It creates the space for compassion to be there, and for love to be there. Just be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. Everything we do, all our actions, all our relationships, everything has its origin or beginning in the mind. The Buddha said in first verse of the Dhammapada that mind is the forerunner of all things. What we do in our practice in this practice of mindfulness, of meditation, what we want to do is to look at and investigate and explore and finally to understand the nature of this mind, this mind which is the forerunner, the origin, the creative aspect of all things. When we look carefully at the mind, And mind in this sense, in the Buddhist sense, does not mean simply intellect. It really means what in English could best be a compound word of mind and heart. And in many Asian languages, actually the same word is used for both mind and heart. So somehow we have to think of mind as encompassing both. All aspects of consciousness of thought, of emotion, of feeling, of perception, of silence. So our practice is to investigate the nature of this mind, the nature of this essentially creative energy, which is our lives. When we look and explore through a careful attention and a careful mindfulness, we begin to understand that the mind is a constantly changing and constantly transforming creative energy. It's not static. It's not steady. It does not remain the same for even a split second. It's in a state of continual flux, continual transformation, continual reconditioning. So as we begin to look at it, and to understand, we see the different qualities of mind which are con- continually reconditioning this energy. And we explore many different aspects, many different kinds. We see or feel, become aware of the factors of love, of fear, of joy, of anger, of mindfulness, of alertness, of slothfulness, of greed, of generosity, of compassion. All of these different aspects, all of these are different qualities 
which arise in the mind and recondition, transform the quality of consciousness in that moment. So we pay attention, and as we pay attention, we learn about these different qualities. It's in that sense that we take all of these different aspects as objects of our meditation. There is nothing which lies outside of the practice. Because what we want to do is to understand the totality of ourselves, the totality of this mind energy. If it's possible to look at it, to observe, with interest. We take interest in every aspect that manifests itself. In the sense of wanting to understand what that particular quality of mind is like. So is it possible to take as much interest in fear or in slothfulness as it is in clarity or mindfulness or joy. Not to separate out or not to identify with any one part, but rather to keep this quality of investigation, seeing that all of these qualities are another aspect or another manifestation of this creative mind energy. As we keep this level of interest and understanding, it becomes increasingly clear what aspects of the mind or what factors of mind lead to more suffering, are suffering in themselves and lead to more suffering. We begin to see for ourselves directly, not through what we've studied or what we've heard, but through our direct intuitive seeing touching, contact with these states, we begin to see what qualities or factors of mind lead to freedom, lead to peace, lead to happiness. And it comes not from any kind of preconception, it doesn't come from any particular kind of belief system. It comes from this very direct personal observation. We look at the mind, we look at it carefully, We're going to see all of these different components. The literal meaning of the word vipassana, which is this kind of meditation, it means to see things clearly or to see things as they are. So that's what we do. We sit and we walk and we go through the day making the effort to see things as they are to see the body as it is, the different elements of the body, the different sensations, to see the mind as it is, in its state of continual flux and transformation. Again, as we watch, as we watch carefully, not only do we begin to understand and observe the different aspects or the different characteristics of various mind states, we also begin to understand, to some extent, some of the laws which govern this flux, this flow of change. Because things are not happening chaotically, they're not happening randomly. It's true that everything is changing momentarily. And that the more refined our perception becomes, we begin to experience that in ourselves, the momentariness of experience. The things are arising and passing instantaneously, arising and vanishing. But this process of change is happening lawfully. And that's one of the most fundamental meanings of the word dharma. Dharma means law. It means the laws governing this flow of change. So we look and we pay attention and we see more carefully and more precisely both what it is that's happening and also the laws governing the unfolding. 
Because it's only when we understand the law, we can be in harmony with it, that the mind can come to a place of peace. Because if we're not in harmony with the law, when we don't understand it, so then we're in continual conflict and struggle. One of the laws, which is the most, one of the most basic governing principles of this flow of changing elements, the elements of the mind, the elements of the body, one of the most basic laws which govern this flow of change is the law of karma. Very simply, what that law says or expresses is the fact that depending upon the motivation behind an action, a certain result will occur. That actions are not happening independently of results. That action, volitional action, motivated action, brings about a certain result, a certain effect. And the effect depends on the motive behind the act. So, for example, when we act based on greed or hatred or delusion, it brings about a certain result, namely a painful result, some kind of unhappiness, some kind of pain. When we act motivated by generosity, by love, by wisdom, by compassion, That motive, the motive behind that action, is like a seed which bears the fruit of some kind of happiness or some kind of peace. Actions bring result. They do not happen in a vacuum. Understanding that our actions condition the nature of the mind. This mind is a continually transforming energy and it's transforming according to certain laws. And one of the laws governing the transformation is this law of karma. We can experience that, this conditioning aspect of our actions. We can experience it both in the present moment and also see how it unfolds over time. One way that our actions or our present mind states condition the way we perceive the world have an effect in the present moment. It's probably, it's an experience which you probably are very familiar with. You can be, you know, in a very beautiful surrounding. And suppose the mind is filled with greed or filled with anger at that time. That anger or that greed acts as a filter on our perception. And so has a very powerful, immediate, present karmic effect. Because it colors how we view that reality. It's as if we're perceiving things through the filter of that mind state. So often people can be in the most luxurious surroundings, the most beautiful surroundings, and if their minds are filled with defilements, it becomes a state of suffering. And likewise, people can be living in very unpleasant surroundings or poor surroundings, and if the mind is filled with wholesome states of love or compassion or generosity or understanding, the present karma of those mind states transforms the experience, transforms that reality into one of happiness. So that's one way of understanding karma. The present effect of these different factors in the mind. 
is another way we experience the karmic result of actions. And this also becomes very apparent in the sensitivity that develops during intensive practice. And that has to do with the aspect of the mind which retains impressions of all our past actions. And probably as you've sat here over these past weeks, perhaps at different times, different memories come to mind. And sometimes they're pleasant memories or memories of our own pure actions, moments of generosity or great love, and we feel happy because of that. It creates a sense of rapture in us. At other times, memories come up to the mind or images of the mind, perhaps, of things we've done which have been unskillful, really actions of perhaps greed or hatred, And as they come back to the mind, as they arise again to the surface, these impressions which are held in the mind, often these impressions, these memories become a a source of remorse to us. Especially in the sensitivity and the openness that occurs when people practice, we begin to feel very deeply the effect of our past actions. On both sides, we we feel the joy and we also feel the strong remorse. So this is another karmic effect. That those actions that were done were not done and lost. That the effect of them remains in the mind as an impression. There's another way we experience the karmic result. And also it comes often in intensive meditation practice when as we're going through the day of sitting and walking, sometimes we experience very directly a specific, a specific karmic result of a past action. Anupandita was here, told a number of stories, one of which, um, particularly illustrates this point. He said that there came to the center in in Rangoon, in Burma, a man who previously had been a guerrilla fighter in the mountains or jungles of Burma and had engaged in tremendously violent acts, had killed people and tortured people and very violent And somehow, through the wisdom of his wife and the the skill of his wife, who managed to extricate him from that particular entanglement, through a long series of events, he ended up at the meditation center. It was quite a transformation of environment. And he began to practice. He was watching rise and falling and doing the walking, And slowly, as he started going deeper, he went through a stage, as Upandita recounted the story, of this tremendous, this overwhelming physical suffering as if he were being beaten and tromped upon and stamped upon and all kinds of very strong and powerful sensations which were understood to be the very direct karmic result of many of the actions that he had performed. In the meditation, because things get so intensified, it's almost as if the whole process, this process of karmic fruition, in some way is speeded up. We begin to experience in ourselves, the result of our past actions. So as you're sitting with this stabbing pain, or 
you know, feeling of being crushed, uh, you know, burning up. It's probably better to experience that here than in one's next life. That's another way that the law of karma uh, relates to our present experience, is conditioning the law of karma is governing how our process is unfolding. It's not by accident. The things that we experience are not happening accidentally. There's another aspect to it also, which has to do with how our actions habituate us to certain patterns. As we do things, it becomes easier to do that action again. Each time we do it, whether it's wholesome or unwholesome, every moment of mindfulness makes the next moment that much easier. Every moment of greed or every moment of anger strengthens that factor, and so different patterns in us become habituated. That's another way of understanding the karmic unfolding. That actually in each moment, we are reconditioning different elements or different energies in the mind, depending on what factors are being practiced or cultivated in that moment. So we see how, how the mind state affects our perception of our present reality. We see how the mind retains impressions of past actions, becoming the source of remorse or the source of joy in us. We experience the actual karmic fruits of actions. We begin to see how our patterns have been established through the practice, either conscious or unconsciously, of certain qualities. In all these ways, we, we can begin to get a sense of how this mind of ours, this creative energy of mind, is being conditioned according to the law of karma, according to this law that our actions bring about certain results. Why is this so important? And there's quite a bit of emphasis on this law of karma in the Buddhist teachings and in our understanding of our practice. The reason it's so important and so emphasized is that when we understand or even begin to understand how each moment in many different ways conditions the next, then we can begin to feel a sense of responsibility for our actions. We begin to see how important it is that we cultivate wholesome mind states or skillful mind states, one that, ones that are going to lead us to what we want, where we want to go. It's the understanding that the responsibility is ours, that there is nobody who can purify our minds. The defilement and purification of our minds lies totally within our own responsibility. Nobody on the outside can do it. So when we see that, when we understand that, it can give a tremendous sense of both respect for what can be done and encouragement and inspiration to do it. There's a job to do. And we can learn the path and walk the path and accomplish it. But it's not enough to know this intellectually. It's not enough to even begin to get a sense that actions bring about results and that the responsibility is ours. 
We need some tool, we need some strength, we need some power in the mind which will allow us to take effective action, to do skillful practice. And there's one particular power of the mind that I'd like to speak about tonight because it is greatly undervalued and underestimated and misunderstood in our culture. And that is the strength and the power of restraint. The quality of restraint in the mind. It's a tremendous strength. It's one of the powers which enables us to cultivate what's wholesome and to abandon what's unwholesome. There are different aspects to restraint. One aspect of it can be understood as letting go of that which is unskillful. Suppose a thought arises in the mind, a desire arises in the mind, and we know that that desire, or that want, or that anger, whatever it may be, we know that that particular arising in the mind is going to lead to suffering. We can see that. We see that it's going to create more pain, more suffering for us. Restraint is that power and that strength which sees that and is able to let go. To restrain the acting out of that desire or that want or that anger. It's the letting go of that which is unskillful. It's learning how to say no to the mind. Something comes up in the mind and we see that it's going in a direction that causes pain, that causes suffering, and we learn how to say, no, I'm not going to do that. It's very important to understand the nature of this no. Because very often people mix in or confuse with this no a whole host of other things like aversion, like judgment, like denial, like repression. All of that is quite extraneous to the no. Saying no to the mind, saying no to an unskillful desire, does not mean that we're filled with aversion towards it. It doesn't mean that we hate it. It doesn't mean that we judge ourselves, that we're bad for having it. It doesn't mean that we are repressing it and pretending that it's not there. None of those things are in the purity of this no. This no is simply seeing that particular mind state for what it is, seeing that it leads to suffering, and saying no. Saying no in a very loving way. As if there was a child who was about to do something that was going to cause it harm or hurt. How would you relate to that child? You'd say, no, can't do that. You don't beat the kid, and you don't tell the kid how terrible he is, and you just say, no, can't do that. We will be doing very well in our practice if we treat our minds like (laughs) two-year-olds. Because that's generally the level (laughs) at which our minds are operating. And so we want to treat it like a child, you know, and all of these desires and wants and wants to do everything. And some things are fine. Some things are no problem. Other things are hurtful, are harmful, are going to create suffering. Can we learn to say no? 
tremendous power in that, tremendous strength. And we train ourselves gently. It's not a forcing and it's not a tightening. Just slowly and gradually and gently, but quite persistently, we practice this quality, we practice this aspect of restraint. What's strange when when we stop to consider this is that our minds have to be convinced to let go of what brings it suffering. Isn't that strange? (laughs) But it's the case. So we practice it and we, we train ourselves in that. And it might be helpful during the day just with little things, you know, perhaps a little desire rises in the mind. And even if it's no big problem, just for the practice, just for the, you know, the development of it, just for your amusement, <laughs> just try saying no. You know, this desire comes, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and as you practice it, if you start gently and lovingly, you'll see that it becomes a tremendous source of strength. It really is a power in the mind. Okay, there's another aspect of restraint. It's not simply the letting go of that which is unskillful. Restraint can also be understood as the conservation of energy. As we practice, and I think you've seen this, as we practice, there's an energy buildup. There's a buildup of emotional energy, there's a buildup of physical energy, of intensity, buildup of mind energy. And it's often an image which comes to mind sometimes is that of, you know, an expanding balloon. You blow the balloon up and the balloon expands. This energy is filling it. We're sort of like this balloon. And through the intensive practice, we're stretching. We're stretching our minds. We're stretching the um, how much energy our bodies can accommodate. It's a big stretch. Often it feels uncomfortable. Now, as as the momentum of energy builds up and as we go into this stretch, sometimes it doesn't feel so easy or comfortable. So the tendency very often is to let a little air out of the balloon, you know, to release some of the energy, to have these energy leaks so that we feel more okay. Restraint in this sense means that we restrain those energy leaks. We don't let the momentum of energy disperse, but we keep it building. And this is essential in order to go deeper in the practice. Because the increasing depth of understanding comes from greater and greater power in the mind, penetrating power. And it comes from the buildup of this momentum, the the continual application of mindfulness, moment after moment after moment, we pay attention in a careful way and this energy builds up and instead of leaking it out, we restrain those those ways that we leak to keep it building, to keep it growing. How do we leak energy? We all have our favorite ways. And it it would be useful for you to consider you know, through the day how that happens, and to see if it's possible to restrain it or to to plug the leaks. Talking is a a tremendous energy leak in the practice, in this kind of situation. Writing. How many notes a day do you write? Or extra cups of tea, or different things. Take a look. And see the ways in which 
the energy momentum can be conserved because that that greatly facilitates the deeper penetration in the practice. So we look at restraint also as a conservation, a conservation of energy rather than a dispersal of energy. There's a third aspect of restraint. There's the letting go of what's unskillful. There's a conservation of energy. And the third aspect of restraint has to do or effects a quite radical transformation of our understanding. In the, in the Abhidhamma, the Buddhist psychology, one of the phrases used for defilements of mind, one of the, the words used for defilements is outflows. Now, and it's a, very, it's a very descriptive word of how the defilements work. It's an outflow of the mind. Right, through desire, through anger, through hatred, through wanting, through greed, through grasping. If we can restrain the outflows, it allows us a very different perspective on the nature of this mind and body, on the nature of experience. Because it's It's the outflows of the mind or the outflows of the heart which keep us locked in in quite a solid way, solidified way to our bodies, to the experience outside. We get very entangled through compulsive desire or compulsive anger, the pattern or habit of anger or hatred. We get locked in, we get plugged in, and everything gets solidified. The sense of self becomes very strong. If we can restrain the outflows, these bonds, these are, these are the, the steel bonds which bind us to phenomena. If we can restrain those outflows and settle back into the simple and easy and spacious awareness of things arising and passing away, we begin to experience directly the impermanence and the insubstantiality of phenomena, which is very difficult to perceive if we're driven by compulsive or addictive desire or wants or anger. Because those outflows or those defilements solidify the sense of self, solidify the sense of I. And restraint, that is not allowing the outflows to go out. The restraint allows us to settle back and to see how all phenomena, all these elements of the mind, all the elements of the body, everything we experience through the sense doors, sight and sound and smell and taste. How everything is simply arising and passing and arising and passing. And there's a tremendous sense of opening, of spaciousness, because we're not solidifying things. We're not solidifying the sense of I through the strong desire, a strong aversion. This restraint in this aspect allows the mind to get unplugged or disentangled. There's a, there's a short verse which describes the quality of mind which is not bound to phenomena. It says, See all of this world as a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, 
a phantom in a dream. All images of transparency, of insubstantiality, of momentariness, of impermanence. I see all of this world as a star at dawn, just about to vanish. A bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, flickering lamp, a phantom in a dream. When we can perceive phenomena, phenomena of the mind and body, of all the sense objects, when we can perceive it in this way, there's no tightness, there's no holding, there's no grasping. There's just this openness and ease and softness of allowing things to arise and pass. And that softness comes about through the power of restraint. When we restrain the outflows which bind us, which solidify us. So there's the restraint of letting go of unskillful action. There's the restraint which is a conservation of energy, allows us to build up the momentum of energy. And there's the restraint of settling back, allowing the mind to open up to the insubstantiality of phenomena. All of these different aspects of what restraint means. When we're no longer driven by compulsive desire, by the addictive quality of the mind, when we can settle back and see the impermanence and see the insubstantiality, that creates in us a spaciousness in the mind and an ease in the mind which allows then for the manifestation of loving and compassionate action. Because the mind that is filled with wanting or filled with craving or tied in through these outflows, locked in, to experience, there's no room, there's no space for real caring, or real loving, or real compassion. And so it's through the power of restraint that we create the space and the softness in ourselves to manifest the wisdom, to manifest the compassion and manifest the love. We manifest it through generosity. And it becomes easier as we see that things are so insubstantial and impermanent. Out of that seeing, out of that wisdom, naturally comes more generosity because we see there's nothing to hold on to. It becomes so much easier then to give and to share and to offer. We're not so holding on for ourselves because we've penetrated through the essential mm, Emptiness of self, of I. We begin to actualize the force of compassion in our lives. Not simply open to it and feel it in ourselves, but through the power of restraint in all of its different aspects, compassion becomes a force, becomes a way that we actually relate And you know, if you're in relationship to somebody, whether an intimate relationship or a broader relationship with many people, it's impossible to act compassionately if the mind is filled with wanting. If we want something, if we're filled with wanting from that person, where is the space for compassion? Where is the space for love in that? So through the power of restraint, as we begin to let go to some extent of the wanting, of the desire, of the anger, it creates the space for a different kind of relationship. It creates the space for compassion to be there and for love to be there. At the end of 
Huxley's life, Aldous Huxley, who spent many years in different kinds of spiritual seeking and practice, and who apparently was a very wise and open-hearted person. He was asked what he found to be the essence of the spiritual path and all his years of seeking and looking. And he expressed it very beautifully. And he was, he was quite, of quite philosophical bent. He had this amazing intellect. What he said was that after a lifetime of looking and exploring, what he found to be at the heart of it was that we should be kinder towards one another. There's something so beautiful and so simple about that. But in order to be kinder to one another, in order to actually do it, not just think of it as a nice idea, in order to actually manifest that kindness and that caring, we have to let go of all those elements in the mind which obstruct it, which block it. And the way of letting go, or one of the ways of letting go, is through the development, through the cultivation of this power of restraint. (coughs) And again, please remember, because in English that word has so many difficult connotations, it's very important to understand clearly what that force is in the mind. Because it is not judgment, and it is not aversion, and it is not repression. It's a very loving, conserving energy. It's a loving no. And it allows us to settle back and to open up to a very expansive state of mind. It's a power that is tremendously helpful in our practice. The power of restraint. Do you have any questions? The difference was more in the emphasis, the first being letting go of what's unskillful, and the third being mm, the restraint of the outflows. The the difference that I meant to mm, highlight was really in the effect, meaning that we let go of that which is unskillful in the sense of leading, when we see something is going to lead us to suffering, lead us to pain, the ability to say no to that doesn't make sense to do that. And the power, the not only just understanding that it doesn't make sense, but to develop the power to say no because something is leading to suffering. In the third aspect, what I meant to emphasize was that through the letting go of the defilements or the outflows, we can begin to see the impermanence and the insubstantiality in a much clearer way. Uh, In this power of restraint and uh Conserving of energy. How do we balance that with a sense of nurturing our own needs and you know, sustaining our own lives in a way that continue following the path of this thing? It really is, just takes kind of honest and sensitive looking, looking at the motive, you know, behind behind an action, and seeing for ourselves. 
it's not so much, uh, should not so much be an imposition from the outside, but coming from our own sensitivity. Is this helpful? Is it not helpful? And developing that strength to say no gently and lovingly to those things which are not helpful. And so you look, you, you pay attention, you know, to both in, in, in our experience here and in the world outside, we pay attention to the wholesomeness or unwholesomeness of a particular desire. Is, is it actually going to nurture us or is it going to bring us suffering? And what's quite amazing is that we know, usually. And if we stop to, to look, it's not such esoteric wisdom. You know, we, we can get a sense. And that also develops a, a very wonderful sense of trust in ourselves. As we practice this ability, we see that we can trust ourselves, which then gives more energy for looking and for the practice. You began by talking about church training the mind, and I want to backtrack here for a second. I'm a little confused about who's training (laughs) who. It seems that there are many levels of the mind, and this mind that's speaking right now, it doesn't always seem to really know what's best, and yet this is the this is the one that looks at the one that makes the fantasies and says notes, right? But it's the mind that what's common and called the unconscious. And sometimes I feel like that's the mind that really knows where it's at and this mind really needs to follow that. I mean I'm just I'm a little confused about the mm-hmm. levels. <laughs> There are many levels of mind, and and the confusion comes, or sometimes comes, when we're talking about different levels, and so sometimes there's a missing, right? because we're talking about um, just as an example of the, of that, and then I'll I'll go on. Uh, in terms of understanding different levels of mind. On one level, we can see that everything's empty, meaning just arising and passing away, and there's, there's no discrimination between good and bad. You know, it's like in the nature of thought. We, we see thoughts just arising and passing. And yet on the level of action, we do discriminate between wholesome thoughts and unwholesome, good and bad thoughts. Sansani, the Korean Zen master, expressed it very, very nicely in the little Zen paradox. He said, there's no right and no wrong, but right is right and wrong is wrong. (laughs) And we have to accommodate both of those in our minds because both are true. There's There's no right and no wrong, and right is right and wrong is wrong. So that's just as an example of, of different levels of mind and learning to understand how we operate on different levels. Mostly with respect to what we trust, which level of mind we trust, the key element The, the the key to the wisdom aspect is really looking at the motivation. And sometimes our motivations are quite hidden. And it takes quite an uncovering or an unlayering to see what our motivation actually is. But that's where the key is. Because that's the... That's where the karmic juice is. Right? It's not in the action, it's in the motive. And so we have to learn... And this is what we do is just as we get more sensitive and refined and honest, as, as we look carefully and honestly at what's happening, 
we get more tuned to what the motive is. And we see, is this a motive of greed? Is it a motive of love, of generosity, of hatred, of delusion? Right? And that's, that's the place to look and to trust. Not so much a concept of, well, we should always trust what, you know, some people call the unconscious, or we should never trust that and always trust the conscious. Uh, I think that's a, that's a confusing model to have. That it's more helpful mm, to look at the motive. And to see that the motive, motivation in the mind will extend through different layers. And sometimes the motive is very conscious and sometimes it's quite unconscious. The fact that it's unconscious doesn't always make it wholesome. Sometimes sometimes it's wholesome and sometimes it's not wholesome. So we have to, in that sense, make conscious what's unconscious. And in some respects, that's what we're doing in our practice. You've probably, to some degree, had the sense of how much what could be called subliminal activity of the mind there is. You know, it's like we're with the breath and we know stuff is going on, but we're not really aware of what it is. It's there and it's conditioning the mind. It's kind of background thoughts or images. Or, right? As the mindfulness gets stronger, all of that subliminal or unconscious below the threshold of consciousness, activity becomes conscious, comes into the uh, field of our awareness. In terms of um, working with this in in real life... This is real life. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, when things come up before you really establish the strength in, in this place, and the reactions are conditioned to, you know, fear and anger, and, and, and it happens, you find yourself reacting and making yourself tired. And is there anything that you can do in the meantime, you know, aside yeah. to watch the reactions? Um, but sometimes they're so overwhelming, you find yourself just no, like that, and and then you've already caused all this pain in yourself. Um, and so, just you know, what do you do in the meantime? <laughs> <laughs> the big long meantime. <laughs> 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 One thing has to do with a certain way of understanding. And it's a way of understanding that is not prevalent in the West. And because it's not well understood, it confuses us a lot and feeds into the dilemma you're talking about. And that is, not totally, but to a large extent in our Western psychological model, We have the idea that you either are expressing things or you're repressing them. That if there's an energy coming up, and that basically there are two choices, you either express it and release it and let it out, and if you're not doing that, it means you're repressing it and pushing it down. I think that's a very limited polarity and dichotomy, and it closes off a very powerful and important middle ground, middle path, which is neither repression nor expression, which is that place where we can be aware and be open to the whole range of energies that may come, the wholesome ones and the unwholesome ones. So there's fear and there's anger and there's hatred and there's desire and there's lust and all of those, all of those things. If we have it clearly in our mind that there's a third alternative between repressing it and expressing it, 
namely to open to it and to be aware of it and to feel it without identifying with it. And this is what we're practicing. We're practicing creating and developing that space. So it doesn't mean that they're not going to come because, as you pointed out, they are going to come and probably for quite a while. Um, The more or the stronger the mindfulness is, which is really the... um, the characteristic quality of that space. The stronger the mindfulness is, the greater ability we have to contain or accommodate those energies without necessarily acting on them. And it takes practice, and it's what what this is all about. It's practicing that quality of mindfulness, which is not judging and not condemning anything. So when these states come, it doesn't mean that we feel aversion towards them or we judge them or we judge ourselves for having them. All of that is extra. And it also doesn't mean that we start wallowing in them and an an identified involvement with them because that's extra too. There's the simple awareness of what's actually going on, the simple mindfulness. And then we see that those states, like everything else, they arise, and they may be very strong and very intense. Can we be big enough to accommodate that energy? It's like, it's like having this big storm wash through. Okay, so we just sit and kind of watch it wash through, and it passes away. So the stronger the mindfulness, the greater our ability to stay centered right, at those times. And then it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, something that that supports the mindfulness in that situation is this quality of interest. If we see that all of these forces are really elemental forces of the mind, the mind is this... (laughs) The mind is this wonderful creative energy which is throwing up all of this different stuff. The different stuff being these different forces, these different elements, very basic, primal elements. Isn't it interesting? (laughs) I mean, mean, every, every time anger comes, every time sadness comes, every time rage comes, every time joy comes, or happiness or compassion, it's a chance to understand that element, that primal force. So it's wonderful. If we can keep that attitude, you know, of interest, rather than either trying to push it away or just getting lost in it. So that's, that's where the, that's where the joy of Dharma practice comes from. Okay, I think, uh, that's enough. A a few, (laughs) I'll restrain myself.